film you're about to watch is not an attempt to prove or disprove any particular aspect of the UFO phenomenon. It is a presentation of information and witness testimony, along with some analysis with the intention of getting closer to the truth on this vast subject. Let's start by stating that many people in high places are UFO believers, or at the very least are open-minded on the subject. In October 2012, Prince Philip instructed his aide, Captain Richard Hutton, to write in response to a rich palate viewer. His Royal Highness continues to keep an open mind on the subject of UFOs. For the last two and a half years I've been collecting UFO reports from members of the public. The Rich Planet website, which is promoted by the Rich Planet TV show, and hence receives around 1,700 visitors a day, has a page dedicated for visitors to report their UFO sightings. Witnesses are required to fill in many specific fields. This enables me to capture every aspect of the person's experience. A report like this one is then generated. Further dialogue can then be conducted with the witness, and in some cases, a recorded interview. Before I describe what is being reported, it's important to point out some of the objects often seen in our skies which are easily mistaken for a UFO. These are Chinese lanterns, and have become very popular for letting off at parties and special occasions. They are usually let off in groups of five or six, and move silently across the sky, emitting an orangey glow. I filmed these Chinese lanterns over Torquay in 2009. They will generally all move in the same direction, according to the prevailing wind. Many of the UFO reports I've so far received have been rejected, because what is described is similar to lanterns. In this example, the witness states, Steady moving orange UFO at a few thousand feet altitude over house heading west. It never flashed or flickered like a lantern or a plane, and made no noise. Then, after five minutes, another identical one followed. In total, there was about five minutes interval between each one. Reports like this one have to go straight in the bin, as it is far too likely they are simply lanterns. Another aerial object which has become increasingly popular over recent years is the model aircraft. They don't all look like aircraft, and some of the manoeuvres which can be achieved by relatively inexpensive models are quite incredible, using high-powered, electronically controlled propellers. Model aircraft are often fitted with coloured LED lights, so one can imagine what this small, multi-rotor aircraft would look like at night if it was lit up. Before we look at some witness testimony, I want to make a simple point about this much misunderstood subject. The major area of contention and controversy with the UFO issue is whether or not non-human, some say alien, entities are responsible for some of the unidentified objects. The most popular argument used by people claiming that UFO craft cannot be of non-human origin is that the distance to the nearest star would mean it impossible for them to travel here. Quite a narrow viewpoint in my eyes. Firstly, because it assumes we know everything there is to know about physics and the universe, which we undoubtedly do not. And secondly, it ignores the possibility that there are bases on or near the Earth which could have been here for millennia. There is, however, a third possibility in this argument, which people who haven't delved into the subject are usually oblivious to. This is that some UFO craft may have their origins in some kind of collaboration of the two. It is widely claimed by many there have been technology exchanges between one or more outside groups and the US military. So it could be that UFOs witnessed are human controlled but utilise outside technology, or that the military are party to non-human craft being flown by ETs in some kind of joint project. The testimony for such possibilities is extensive, and I would recommend these three books for starters. The first, written by Philip J. Corso, a retired US Army lieutenant, describes how a top secret group took control of the famous Roswell craft, recovered in New Mexico in the summer of 1947. Critics often say, if they are so advanced, how come they are crashing in the desert? It has been claimed the military were experimenting with a new type of radar beam in that area in 1947, and that it may have interfered with the craft's propulsion or navigation systems. Corso goes on to describe that the purpose of the project he was involved with was to examine the recovered craft they had acquired in order to learn about the technology, and even introduce some of the technology to certain corporations within the military-industrial complex. The second book includes testimony from physicist Bob Lazar, who made detailed claims in 1989 about a specific area within the infamous Area 51, known as S4, where he claimed nine different types of extraterrestrial craft were being stored, and there were ongoing projects to decipher how these craft's propulsion systems operate. Lazar's testimony has recently been corroborated with information given to Richard Dolan from an ex-CIA official who visited the facility under instructions from President Eisenhower. 
The third book is written by retired U.S. Army Sergeant Dan Sherman, who was drafted into a top-secret NSA communications project in the 1980s. He claims that in 1961, the NSA started a joint project with a group of extraterrestrials involving advanced methods of what he describes as intuitive communication. When I, when I was initially um, uh, brought into the program, they referred to it as a slant mission. Mm -hmm. They refer, referred to it as um, a gray. So, uh, but, but I, I they don't also know the told reason. you that, it was, that aliens were involved. Yeah, they, yeah. They, when he described the onion effect with the security classifications, he mentioned that the black projects you know, were at a certain level, and then gray projects, which have to do with alien technology, research and development, or communication, um, any of those things, they were classified as a gray project. Right, okay. And he mentioned that the, the project itself had uh, kicked off in, I, I believe he said 1961, All right. and they started to abduct human females um, for testing for this genetic procedure that they were going to conduct. And when I say they, it was uh, a joint project with the alien, the alien race, whatever you want to call it and uh, the American government. Yes. Uh, and you said it was joint, so you think that, because you described it as a, a military abduction, so it's not necessarily military, it's perhaps it's a joint thing. So do you think, well, the, you think it's the alien technology that was being used for the abduction rather than the military technology? Oh yeah, I, I, I think, um, let me back up here, I, the actual abductions themselves were conducted by the aliens, right? And, and the procedures were done by the aliens. I say it was in conjunction with the military because the military knew about it. Dan Sherman's story is very detailed, and he is a highly credible whistleblower. It's difficult to dismiss all the claims of alleged ET collaboration out of hand. The Roswell event, for example, has produced many reliable accounts. When considering UFO reports, we must not fall into the age-old argument, was it an alien ship or was it a human ship? We might be overlooking a third possibility that their origin is in part alien and in part human. In fact, it doesn't really matter what camp you are in. I am happy for your belief to reside in whichever part of this diagram you choose, because the testimony in this film will show there are vehicles in our skies whose characteristics cannot be explained by the science in our publicly available physics and engineering textbooks. Somebody is flying silent aerial vehicles on a fairly regular basis in many locations around the UK without the consent of the public, and everyone should be concerned about this. Everyone. Another factor we need to consider is the advanced aircraft that have undoubtedly been developed, usually for the US military, by the secretive Lockheed Skunk Works. One commentator who speaks about many of the prototype craft that have been designed or developed is Michael Schratt. Some of the declassified craft designed in the 1980s make the mind boggle. For example, version 2 of the TAV will go in a low Earth orbit, can orbit the Earth three times without refueling, and can travel from Los Angeles to Melbourne in 55 minutes. They have also designed nuclear power craft, and another secret craft, the B-2 bomber, once airborne, is alleged to be able to switch into an electric mode, possibly utilising silent anti-gravitic propulsion. It's also worth noting here that the sheer variety and exoticness of the secret aircraft designed and developed by Lockheed, which have so far been declassified, suggests they may be decades ahead of the technologies developed by NASA in their rocket programs. When people see a UFO, and others suggest it may have been a secret American aircraft, the response is often, why on earth would they be testing a secret aircraft over some mundane part of the UK? This 1997 article alleges that in Hampshire, in 1994, a top-secret US spy plane, which flies at the edge of space at five times the speed of sound, crashed at the British experimental airbase Boscombe Down. The SAS was scrambled to throw down a cordon round the wreckage. The aircraft was believed to have been the Astra, or Aurora, a craft which to this day the US military still denies exists. Michael Schratt also claims another secret aircraft crashed on the East German border region in 1989. The only known illustration of a top secret aircraft that crashed in the East German border region during the first month of the Bush senior administration had a crew of two that sat tandem. Now I'm proposing that this was a Lockheed design just for the fact that you can see the same faceted flat plate technology used on the F-117. It had four or uh, three balls. There were two up front, one in the aft section. And when this particular aircraft crashed that you'll see right here, there was a hull breach on the port side and then near the aft section of the hull, there was a crack or bent at about a 15 degree angle. One of these balls popped out, it was later recovered by crew. It had the consistency of a pineapple or a seashell. And there was a interesting gold braid embedded into these balls. And when these gentlemen recovered one of these spheres and they put this box around it, this box actually popped up on its own. So it had some residual effects 
still going on. Bear in mind, this is only Michael Schratt's opinion that this was a Lockheed aircraft. He does not know for sure it was of that origin. So we know from these incidents that undisclosed aircraft are flown over Europe and the UK without the knowledge of our elected parliament. <laughs>
Although the Air Force has never admitted it, evidence showed that one of their jets crashed while chasing the triangular UFO. Max Burns has recovered aircraft parts from the incident and located the spot where the aircraft came down. Questions were asked in Parliament, but again, the MOD continues to cover up this incident. These cases are just the tip of an iceberg of silent flying triangle incidents. Many cases have been diligently documented by veteran UFO researcher Oma Fowler, many of which have taken place in Derbyshire. Uh, December 94 to, January, uh, to um, May 95, mm -hmm. we had 52 flying triangle incidents over Derby. We had one less than a mile from this very spot, right. where one hovered over a traffic island in the middle of the rush hour, 6.30ish at night, and the traffic was queued up, uh, you know, usual sort of thing, and one driver happened to be patiently waiting for the traffic to move, happened to glance up, and there was a huge black triangle hovering over the uh, traffic island, just studying the traffic. Right. The craft are almost always silent, black, and usually with three lights in the corners, and sometimes one red light in the centre. Let's take a look at a few of the testimonies from witnesses reporting their cases to Rich Planet. I noticed uh, a yellowy orangey light um, just to my side then. I, I, I thought, oh, that's, that, there's no street light out there. I thought it was a street light at first. So mm. I, I sort of did a double take mm -hmm. and I saw three orangey yellow lights uh, and they were sort of moving in towards right. each other. Mm -hmm. These uh, lights sort of moved in uh, and, until they disappeared. Uh, and then they seemed to be replaced by just random dots of light, mm -hmm. which were sort of moving. So I, I would imagine that they were all on a huge craft that was actually turning. Mm -hmm. And then these lights were coming towards me. Mm -hmm. And as it come towards me, and it, it took shape. It, it, it was a triangle, a big, right. huge triangle with right. the lights all the way around the edge. And it went over my flat. Mm -hmm. uh, and it ended up me out of my flat window with my mobile phone trying to get a photograph of the thing. Right. Uh, were the lights just along the sides or were they on the corners? Just I'd, I'd say no more than eight on each side. Right, okay. I think there were fewer on the back side of it. Mm -hmm. and, and there was one red one in the centre. One red one well. in the centre. Yeah. And three white lights with a red flashing light. Mm -hmm. But what, what struck me most was it seemed to be still. It seemed to be completely still. It was like maybe four to five hours high, mm -hmm. if you get me. Mm -hmm. But um, what, what I noticed is it was sort of rotating like that. That's why these lights, look, yeah. that's why these lights looked like they were going into each other. But they weren't because it was like a solid object. I, I looked up first and I saw this massive, great big what, black triangle sitting mm. in there. And it wasn't, um, it seemed to be absorbing the light. It, you could see it against the light pollution, this thing. It's the size of it, it's massive, like a great big football suit. So it was blacker than the surrounding sky. It was blacker than the sky. Right. That's how we could see it. And give me an estimate of size, Dean. Well, it must have been like a bigger than a football field. It must have been at least a football field in size. It, it was right. huge. Uh, um, the height. I think was about three or four houses high, right. heading towards north northwest from right. south south east. Right. And then it, it kind of moved backwards towards me, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean, but like really slow and smooth. And that's, that's why I knew that's not an aeroplane, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. It was like really slow and smooth, like backwards like that. And then it moved forwards like that way. Mm -hmm. And then it sort of just did that a few times and then just headed off. Right. But there were no sound at all, that's what was weird. The craft was going like that right. and turning round. Eventually those lights on the back disappeared mm -hmm. and I could just see it like a cluster of lights. And, and the cluster of lights were moving mm -hmm. and then they all started coming towards me like that. And as it got closer and started going above, I, I could see then it was a triangle. Okay. It was absolutely massive, this right. thing. Um, it had a white point of light. At each, co at each point there was a white piercing light. And in the centre was a small cluster of red and orange, like honeycomb arrangement of lights at the centre. It's just sitting there. I didn't see it move. Nothing holding it up. Nothing holding it up. <laughs> I was looking, yeah, I didn't. I... Did you hear any noise from it? No. I mean, if there was a noise, I probably couldn't hear it because of the engine. One o'clock in the morning, I took the dog out into the garden for his last roll around. Far off in the distance, I could see lights right. flashing. I thought it was a helicopter because of the speed it was travelling at. But the lights were not as a helicopter normally is. They weren't strobing, but it made no sound. And I'm thinking, well, what the hell is this? And this one leading light with the two following, and it, it didn't split up. It was just one, it appeared to be just one solid object. It headed off towards Aquaf, which if you go to Aquaf, you eventually end up in Rotherham, right. if you keep going. And then 
a few days later, that's when I saw that thing in the newspaper. Right. Which is like now, before we go to that, just give us an estimate of the distance and the size. If it were about five houses high, mm -hmm. and then probably about six to eight hundred metres away from me. Right. You've estimated in your witness about statement. Thir about thirty metres ish. If if. Right. In size? Yeah, yeah, like length like that, 30 metres, 30 metres. Right. So this is, so your site was on the 20th of October. Yeah. And then the following, that was a Wednesday, the following Monday. Monday I went back to work, I worked on nights at time. And there was a sighting of a UFO in Rotherham. Yeah, in Rotherham, and it was a black triangle, right. apparently, they right. said. It just says, baffled residents helplessly shouted at the triangular craft as it crept above the South Yorkshire town. And of course it just didn't make a sound, so I couldn't place it what sort of speed do you think it was travelling at? 40 miles an hour? It right. wasn't fast. Eerily, it looked just like an object spotted over Belgium in 1990, which so spooked off on it is that F-16 fighter jets were scrambled to intercept it. That were in 1990, and they've put a picture of that one as well, mm -hmm. which looks yeah. pretty much like what, pretty much dead on what I saw, to be honest. Right. I, this object was coming over the top of the houses, um, and I could see the red lights were starting at the front of the object and flashing down the sides of the object. Uh -huh. So I was initially, this was a head-on view and clearly wasn't anything that I could recognise. Right. So as it, as it drew closer, I could make out it was a flat triangular shape. It just maintained the same speed, it didn't alter. But looking at it from underneath, mm -hmm. I was seeing a light there, is mm -hmm. that in frame? Mm -hmm. A light there and a light there. Which About three quarter football pitch. Right. All right. Okay. So. Is a rough. Pretty big then. Yes. Yeah. It was All right. pretty big. And what I was seeing was red lights flashing sequentially down the craft from the front to the back, mm -hmm. um, the full length of the object, um, say about ten lights. Mm -hmm. And again, as it started coming closer, I was now more looking side on. Um, and it, the height of this thing was probably around 500 metres, I'm guessing. So not very high at all, um, but certainly high enough above the houses. But as the first object came into closer and came side on, a second object, identical to the first one, appeared underneath it. And I noticed that the sky around the lights started to sort of wobble, in effect, like a rippling effect, mm -hmm. around the outside of what turned out to be a triangular shaped craft. Mm -hmm. And once it started to ripple, you could see this object materialising, it was just like Star Trek, like decloaking right in front of our eyes around the lights. Mm -hmm. Once we realised that the, it was a craft there, the craft floated its nose into the air. Now I say floated, it, it manoeuvred like no other craft I've seen. I've been in the aircraft industry, I've been to air shows, I know what craft look like when they move about. This thing was floating, it looked like it was underwater, like a submarine. A size again guessing is 20 to 30 metres long, mm -hmm. the objects. Certainly not um, huge like some reports have said yeah. of football field size objects yeah. it certainly wasn't that big um, but larger than your, your average two-seater plane or yeah. what have you basically there were just these four big lights along the back mm -hmm. and like i say they weren't a parallel to the ground they were tilted at an angle now i also noticed in the course if there was a little light off to one side and mm -hmm. um, it turns out that that would be the one underneath the nose at the front but at this point we didn't know that we could just see four lights at the back and one under the front and it was at this point that the triangle tilted up in the air, but it rose, like I say, like a submarine underwater. Now, once it did that, we could see on top of the surface all these lines interlocking, look like girders. Any noise at all? No. And again, this is a, the thing that drew on me then, is that I couldn't hear a thing. Right. Um, and what sort of speed? And again, the, the speed was most definitely slower than your average airspeed for, for any aircraft right. that I've okay. seen. Okay. So they were drift, almost, you could say drifting, but there was no bobbing motion. They were on a very set, steady course. This is showing the central white core of the craft. And I've tried to show here how the top and the bottom rolled over mm -hmm. like this hovercraft skin effect or pastry on a pie. But the thing I remember about this particular view is there was no nuts and bolts, no rivets, no welding. It, it almost been sympathetically put together. As they went past, I noticed Behind them, separated by a few hundred metres again, was another pair of identical objects. And were they like directly one below the other or were yes. they offset? So they weren't offset, they were directly above each other. All right. Um, so one pair drifted past, then another pair, and I counted eight pairs, oh sorry, uh, four pairs, eight craft. Eight craft. But what I would say is we stood there and in the distance flying away from us was the largest flying craft I've ever seen in my life, bearing in mind my aircraft experience from the past. It was a huge craft. Mm -hmm. It was the size of a football field. It got four red lights at the back again. 
but this time on the enormous wings there was a white light at the end of each wing it wasn't strobing it was just shining it was shining up the surface of the craft on both sides and this huge thing was flying flying away from us and right. um, we could only assume that the small craft had gone back to the larger craft just before they went out of view i was getting a, a slight angle of the back end of the craft mm -hmm. and again that was just flat slightly different again no red lights on the back but there were two squares of purple light mm -hmm. and again not a color that i've ever seen on any aircraft right um very distinctive bright purple there, but of a um they were dimmer than the red flashing lights right. and you can i can only guess that they were part of the propulsion system right. But were they making any noise or was there any flame or no, anything? There was out? no flame, no, no, couldn't see any flame or gas coming out the back. Um, it was just light. Right. And any noise at all? Absolutely none whatsoever. And more importantly, there were no smells. You couldn't smell anything. There were no fuel being burnt from like a conventional engine. Bear in mind, these witnesses are just a sample of over 40 black triangle cases I now have in my database. One very strange aspect which crops up again and again in witness statements is these crafts seem to have the ability to appear or disappear in situ. On occasions, witnesses will just see a light, then a triangular craft will seem to materialise around it. This doesn't necessarily mean the material of the craft is being manifested from another dimension. It could be that a field effect around the craft is making the light normally emitted behave differently, therefore making it invisible. I asked some of the witnesses, who do you think these objects belong to? It's possibly a military, even, even though it made itself invisible, you still think they've got that technology? Oh, yeah. It's either, a, it's either military or aliens, right, isn't it? And right, that's it. Right. Why are they flying it over between Pontefract and knows. Rotherham? God knows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the answer. <laughs> that's the, that's that's the, the question that I'm addressing. Yeah, yeah. Why but, would they do it? Whether it's a secret, um, some sort of secret aircraft that's been developed or it's of, you know, some other origin, I don't know. But, you know, immediately you think spaceships, aliens. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would personally think it could be something like a... Um, an aircraft of a, you know, from out. From Some us. secret human That's craft. right, yeah. So why would it be sitting there just hovering above um, the traffic? Well, maybe I, I tend to think like a moth to a candlelight. Obviously something completely unlike our known military aircraft. So it is an airspace that I know is used by the military. Right. Um, uh, not uh, commercial aircraft that low. Right. ET or military? Well, I can only guess that it's most likely come from ET, whether it's ET or our military now, or well, another government's military, okay. anybody's guess. That's speculation, isn't it? Mm. I mean, some people have said to me, was it perhaps a stealth fighter or the stealth bomber? Well, at that distance, I mean, this thing was only like 100 feet away from us. You know, the, the stealth fighter, the F-117, weighs, I think it's 3,800 pounds, mm -hmm. but it's only got two engines which produce 30,000 pounds of thrust. Mm -hmm. It hasn't got enough, but if it had 38,000 pounds of thrust, it would have to stand on its end with engines on full blast just to hover. This craft was not doing that. This craft was manoeuvring around with no noise whatsoever mm -hmm. in the most peculiar fashion. Right. So if it, if it was a stealth aircraft, it's using a propulsion system that hasn't been disclosed yet, presumably. That's right, yes. Yeah. My own personal feeling from the whole experience is that it's definitely not one of ours. I've never seen anything quite like it. Mm -hmm. Now, if this is a secret project from the military, what are they doing in the Leicestershire countryside, jumping out on people? Yeah. driving along in the cars, it, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. The craft seemed to be in no panic to get away from us after the event, not prior to it, because it's my first experience of anything paranormal. Mm -hmm. I have had other experiences. That makes, for me, 100% certain that this is not right. a man-made object. I decided to compare notes with three of the UK's leading UFO researchers. I dare say if you sorted all out the triangular reports, we, mm. we'd have quite a phenomenal number of sightings of the Black Triangle. And uh, they're in a marked police vehicle and they see in the area of North Holt, Middlesex, right. a huge black triangular object which he describes as three size Th uh, the size of three football pitches right. and I said well how do you know it was that big and he says because it was all the three football pitches well he said he said it was something around that sort of size you know right. almost a, almost the size of a, of a football pitch right. and basically the, it was no noise huge proportions low to the ground as low as 50 feet at one point mm -hmm. and it was just motionless hanging there and then seen for a few minutes and then choof, gone in most cases they're either completely silent or sometimes emit a sort of low humming type sound or sometimes right. and the amazing thing is that uh, in, in the 1990s they were coming over majestically uh, over the landscape as if completely impervious of what mm. was happening below them but they were coming over moving I mean, it's a slow it, it, as you said before it's a light at each corner and the big light in the middle about 24 police officers across six counties had basically tracked 
one or two objects. So initially what we thought was a very bright spherical light travelling relatively low in the sky. The object was travelling north to south having come over the sea at Biddeford Bay. We stopped and got out of our police car and as the object approached us from directly in front of us we realised that this object was connected in some way to two duller lights which were travelling behind on an each side of the main bright light. Mm -hmm. that was in effectively in a triangular formation. It travelled fast and most strangely was completely silent. It was a clear still night. The object was enormous in dimensions overall and was like nothing we'd ever seen or experienced. Overall dimensions approximately the size of a football pitch. Which is, it's amazing how many times people use so that. So they saw in the distance three sort of orange and red coloured lights in a triangular shape mm -hmm. um, moving in their direction. Now um, as the lights got closer they realised it was this black triangular shaped object with these lights attached appeared to be on the underside at, the, at each corner um, and they, they also said at a distance that it was doing this kind of weird wavy type motion it, uh, it looked like it was sort of shifting backwards and forwards um, now it's possible that it was some sort of field that was around the object that was causing this distortion and I've looked into other cases where the same distortion effect has been seen mm -hmm. but there's also many many cases where the distortion effect isn't seen so right. you know it's possible some kind of flight mode that they enter where where it looks like this. Now this craft continued to get closer to them and it actually came down in the road and, and hovered about 10 foot. It was within 40 feet of them so it was very very close mm -hmm. um, and it hovered about 10 foot off the ground and uh, they didn't really know what to do. They st uh, stood there staring at it As I mentioned earlier, the question of who do these craft belong to is not necessarily the best question to ask. There is another much more important question I suggest we need to answer first, and if we answer it, we might find out who they do belong to. The question is this, whereabouts do these craft exist when they are not on display in the sky? You know, there is a number of cases where, uh, where the military has tried to intercept these objects, so clearly they um, are interested in them. Right. Uh, why would they want to intercept something if, if they knew what it was? Uh, sometimes they've uh, shown very unusual characteristics uh, such as uh, cloaking, uh, sort of materialising or dematerialising, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes in a clear sky. main argument really ag against them being um, military would be just the advanced characteristics sometimes displayed. Where they go in, what they're doing, where they're stored, well I suppose if you thought it was uh, a man that would created them, uh, then they would probably be in a hangar somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't believe that and I do think they're, they're ET and I just think that's another so aspect uh, of ET. But I'm trying to steer you towards when they're not on display, where are they? Where, do you, well, think, they're, do well you I, think they're a bases? Well, I think there probably are bases mm -hmm. around the world. Uh, ET bases? Yeah. I think they probably are because we still they're still very remote areas. And, and just, I think the sea is a, there's been so many sightings uh, of underwater objects. I've had some cases where they've seen UFOs uh, come up out of and enter the sea. Right, which have been interesting. Not flying triangle cases. If these triangles have got that kind of technology, then maybe they're flying around and we just don't see them, right. and then they decloak, for want of a better phrase, right. uh, and they're there. If we're being visited by extraterrestrials, which I believe that we are, I believe yeah. that there's uh, numerous species visiting the Earth, and I believe they've been here a long, long time, mm -hmm. and will continue to be here for a long, long time. Um, I believe that there, uh, there's some sort of ongoing program that, uh, that they're working on uh, with the human race, and right. they're possibly developing us. Now, it stands to reason that they would have to be somewhere. They're, they're unlikely to just be flying around all the time. So therefore, uh, I'd certainly look into uh, th there being a number of bases, possibly here on the planet, maybe up on the moon, that they would use to, to house these craft. Right. If, we, if we consider undersea or underground bases, y you wouldn't be able to pinpoint any areas that you think are more likely than others? No, uh, no. I, th I, think, I think if, you were, if I was going to have, have a base underwater I'd put it in a really deep trench where nobody goes. Mm. Um, there's, um, there's a number of cases linking uh, with uh, missing time uh, or sort of even mind control sometimes uh, aspects of that seem to be involved um, and uh, also I've dealt with a number of cases that directly link flying triangle craft with uh, the uh, abduction phenomena right. so these bases may have been on the planet for a long time and uh, right. uh, there's a lot of talk about bases in the depth of the oceans that would be a very very good place to put them right. because it's somewhere out of reach of, uh, right. of human civilization. I wondered if plotting all the triangle cases on a map of the UK might give a clue to their origin or indeed their storage location. There does seem to be a significant number in the West Yorkshire and Lancashire region. This region contains large unpopulated areas, has very steep hills and is also home to the famous UFO hotspot known as Todmorden. 
Although none of my triangle cases were specifically over Todmorden, I decided to research online news articles and other UFO websites to gather recent black triangle cases in and around the town of Todmorden. I plotted the sightings on a map. All the activity on this map took place recently, between 2010 and 2012. The red arrows indicate where black triangles have been seen moving, and the arrow indicates the direction. The red triangles show where triangular craft have been seen hovering. A total of nine separate black triangles have been spotted around Todmorden over the last two years, and that's just cases that have been reported. There could be hundreds more unreported. The letter M on the map indicates where a classic animal mutilation case took place in 2002. If you're not familiar with animal mutilation and the possible links to UFOs, you might want to watch one of my previous films, Silent Killers. The green line on the map shows the Pennine Way, a popular hiking route winding from north to south through the UK's mountainous Pennine region. Our UFO experts mentioned cases where craft have been witnessed emerging from the sea. I think at this point it is important to point out an incident written about in Jenny Randall's 1983 book, The Pennine UFO Mystery. On Thursday the 14th of August 1980, Andrew Nightingales and a friend were fishing in the Ogden Reservoir at Helmshore, a small new estate near Rortonstall about four miles west of Bakeup. It was 8.50pm. Suddenly, a circular row of red lights, they think about nine in all, appeared on the surface of the water, just out from the bank. Thinking it was something above them casting its reflection, they quickly glanced upwards. Nothing was there. When they looked back at the water, the lights had vanished. However, within moments, they reappeared, pulsing this time. It was quite clear now that they were watching a large circular object underneath the surface of the reservoir. Naturally, they began to panic and fled from the water's edge, dropping behind their expensive fishing tackle at the mercy of any passers-by. As one of them put it afterwards, there is no way I would go back there until it was daylight. The Todmorden area is littered with reservoirs, some of them on the tops of hills. To the north of Todmorden is a vast expanse of land where there are no roads nor easy access to the land for many square miles. It is one of the largest unpopulated areas in the UK with a barren mountainous terrain. It's also worth pointing out that the Menworth Hill eavesdropping facility is just 25 miles to the northeast of this area. The Lancashire West Yorkshire border is very central to the UK as a whole. It contains some very remote landscape and is surrounded by extremely steep hills. Could the triangles be returning to this area and be using it as a base to access some of the other areas where triangles are commonly seen, such as Stafford, Lincolnshire, Derbyshire, East Yorkshire and further afield? Another important thing to note here, there is not a single piece of witness testimony of a silent black triangle landing at a UK military base. If they are returning to a base, they are not returning to known military bases. If I was asked to speculate, I would guess there might be a facility under the land or inside a hill somewhere in the Todmorden area, which is possibly accessed via a water feature such as a lake or reservoir. It's even less easy with the information available to speculate who might be in charge of such a facility, other than whoever is flying the craft. And with that little revelation, let's ask if anyone has managed to film one of these triangles. Photographs are available of the Belgian flying triangles, but video footage of UK flying triangles is sketchy. This footage, kindly provided by researcher John Hansen, certainly isn't 100% conclusive of anything, but it is interesting. The footage filmed in Neath in South Wales shows a triangle of three lights which remained stationary for at least 20 minutes, hovering over a property at 3.30 in the morning. There are no street lights or any other conventional reason as to why these lights should have been there. The witness who was shooting the film stated that he wishes he had stayed to film the lights for longer, but for some inexplicable reason went to bed after they hadn't moved for 20 minutes. This footage was broadcast on news channel Russia Today, brought to my attention by John Barry. It shows a triangular light formation over the war-torn area of Palestine. If this is a solid object, could it be exhibiting the cloaking abilities mentioned earlier? Is somebody monitoring the hostilities from the comfort of their advanced craft?
UFO researcher Dave Hodrian mentioned that black triangle craft have been associated with alleged abduction cases. The abduction phenomenon will not be covered in this film, but I will make a comment about research which is going on in the UK into this field. There are a number of groups currently operating which claim to support alleged abductees. And this support involves sometimes filming harrowing testimonies of self-claimed abductees' accounts of what they have experienced. In my opinion, the best way to support individuals making such claims is to devise methods which will produce new evidence to either confirm or disprove what they are saying. The self-claimed abductees will only be fully vindicated if and when researchers find strong, tangible evidence. Some organisations claiming to support alleged abductees do not seem interested in finding any tangible evidence, which surely should be the main objective of their organisation. I have had several cases reported to me of abduction, one involving a black triangle UFO. I have interviewed this witness who interestingly acquired a small triangular scar he cannot account for in the middle of his chest the night he witnessed the black triangle and he has several hours he cannot account for. I am aware of other witnesses with similar marks on their bodies. The abduction phenomenon is outside the scope of this documentary but it is something I will be looking into more in the future. The statements made earlier by Dan Sherman are of particular importance here which is that the NSA in the United States have collaborated on abduction projects and have been monitoring worldwide abductions since the 1960s. Sherman also stated that there may be many projects currently running involving abduction. The quest of my future research into this area will be to devise methods capable of producing tangible evidence as to whether abduction is going on or not. Moving on from the triangle cases, one type of UFO that people report are small football-sized spheres, sometimes glowing, sometimes metallic, moving under intelligent control, suddenly changing their direction and speed. Here are just a few testimonies I have from the 18 cases currently in the database. And then all of a sudden, uh, this light came on, just a few feet below me, and it, to my surprise at the time, it was just... Uh, a glowing sphere, a white uh, luminous sphere. So what solid. sort of size are you talking about, Scott? Well, I'm saying about this sort of big. It was floating in midair above the water then? It, it was floating, no, actually above the mud. The water above was, the, mud. the tide was a right. hundred yards away. It was hovering, right, and maybe a foot, uh, no more than 18 inches off the mud. And I could quite s clearly see from the, the glow of it, the luminous, the luminosity, I could see the mud and the shingle underneath. It was a solid ball, you could tell it was solid. Right. I yeah. described it as a football. Perfect. It was like a ball bearing flying through the sky. Right. Right. It was perfect, there were no A's, it was just dead and clear. The ball came along horizontally, went yeah. up vertically, so it was making sudden changes in darting yeah. movements. Yeah, okay. and there was equal as it were going along. It just moved off in a relatively straight line, straight out across the mud and the shingle, towards um, uh, the river channel. Looked up, and it was there, bright silver, and it, it glinted in the light. And there was an orb about 12, 15 inches across. So it's just a little smaller than a be beach ball. And it just hung in the air and it was shining in the light. I give the impression it was like a mild zigzag along that straight line, right. or a, a wobble or a, and this light went right into the beds. Right. Uh, and as a result of that, all the beds erupted off. And all of a sudden it just went <laughs> And we both saw it staying there, and then all of a sudden, straight away. Right. Just went straight up. Now, Frank We tried to follow it, but <laughs> we couldn't. Right. Right. One landed on the bonnet of my car, and came within two or three feet, and stayed for a few seconds to observe me, then flew off at an incredible speed leaving a streak of light behind it. Have you got any thoughts? Have you, have you thought about what it could have been or, or what its origin might have been? I know exactly what it was, a UFO. I've never seen anything like that. I plotted the small sphere sightings on a map and it does seem to reveal a predominance in the South Wales region of the UK. If anyone has an explanation as to why these things are seen in that particular area more than in others, please get in touch. This film would not be complete without a flying saucer case. The one I have chosen took place in broad daylight on a glorious day on the 26th of October 2000, not far from Aberdeen. I interviewed the witness by telephone. 10 a.m. in the morning, so it was daylight. Yes, a beautiful morning, a beautiful thing, a lovely bright morning. Did, did your partner witness it as well? Yes, uh, Mary, she had a she <coughs> seen it as well, I showed it on her. I was, I was actually standing at a party with Dua, with a big party on the lounge, and I was looking out the window and I, I spotted this small... Uh, a small dot in the horizon, well, it was a, a, a large tree line. I noticed this uh, object coming across this tree line. It was just, it was going quite slow, and there was no noise or sound at all in it. And I just watched it and watched it. As it came closer, I, I just said, I wonder what that is. Well, I was thinking it was a helicopter, but 
as it, well, there was no noise, and the place was really quiet because it was a small, it was a small village below then. And as it was coming across, it, and it came closer and closer, and I says, "Well, what the hell is that?" So I shouted at my wife. So I shouted, "Mary!" So she came through and she says, "What is that?" And it was quite uh, metallic looking. It was about thirty feet by thirty by forty feet. It was very, very slow, and it was just drifting across a tree line that came down and moved closer to the house. And I said to myself, "What is this?" So we just both watched it. And it, it took about maybe seven or eight minutes just to go along the tree line. And as it went, as it was just past the house and went it was about 150, 200 feet above, above which we was watching, it just turned and went on to this other area. And just as it was turning, down came two jets, two jet fighters. <laughs> My wife's never seen this, but I've seen it. I went outside the patio to see what it was doing, and it went past the tree line. And because we lived on the River D. It went down the river and they just followed it, but there's no way that it was catching this. This was a way. Mm-hmm. Just a way. And then about oh, five minutes later than that, a big spotter plane came across, you know, with a big radar on top. Mm-hmm. It was low. It, it circled all around for about 10, 15 minutes. It was really fantastic to see, like. Just <laughs> it was metallic. It looked, it looked uh, oh, metal. But mm-hmm. It was dark. It was really dark, and it had a, like a hump in it. It looked as though it had a hump in the middle. But when it turned round, you could see it was a saucer. There was no doubt about it. There was no noise with this, Richard, whatsoever. No noise whatsoever, apart from the jets came across. It was really quite eerie and, and quiet, you know. So it was looking west, and it, it was coming from the west, mm-hmm. and it just came out from the west and it came past the house, and it went. Then it went north, and it went down down the river which is good north then to Aberdeen. I actually researched that date. You know, I knew on the Holy Lock there was a, a, a Merlin helicopter went down in the Holy Lock. Now it came to that direction, which would be <coughs> west of where we lived. <coughs> Quite a bit away, but these things are travelling at such a high speed. There's no way it could come. I mean, it could come to us. It was, it was doing it at six, seven hundred mile an hour. It come to us in probably an hour, you know, mm-hmm. half an hour maybe. It was quite interesting when we researched this because the two fighter jets that went after this the UFO, mm-hmm. as a fighter jet went down in the borders that particular day as well, and the pilot had to eject. Now, what he had to eject for, I'm not saying it, mm-hmm. it, did, it did anything, but it seems very strange. So a helicopter went down on in this place called Holy Lock, and, and a fighter jet? And a fighter jet on the same day, yeah. And do you know where the fighter jet went down? Well, we think it was the borders, round about the borders. Really? This sounds very similar to the Sheffield UFO case, military jets chasing a UFO and then crashing. In this case, a helicopter and a jet, which I am sure will have been covered up. They're not going to admit to endangering the lives of the public by chasing UFOs over populated areas. Anyone who has information on either a Merlin helicopter or a fighter jet crashing on the 26th of October 2000, please get in touch via the website. The cover-up of the UFO phenomenon is sophisticated and comprehensive. Most people are completely unaware that the cover-up extends to most printed media, TV and films. My research leaves me in no doubt there is a major cover-up on the issue, especially when the military are involved. Sheffield and Berwyn are two good examples of a cover-up following military involvement of a UFO. This is a letter handed to me at a conference. I have redacted the name in question. It states that one particular prominent UFO author in the UK in 1991 was paid £25,000 per year from a government agency to persuade this individual to change their stance on UFOs and give a rational explanation and belittle UFO stories. Anyone know a UFO author that did a 180 degree U-turn on their UFO stance? As I said, the cover-up also extends to television. In 2011, I exposed the Channel 5 Berwyn UFO documentary, where program makers were ordered from a high up source to remove all of Scott Felton's testimony from their show. Scott, who has done more research than anyone on the Berwyn case, and found reliable witness testimony that the military were involved, was also removed from a scheduled BBC radio interview on the same subject. Um, I was assured that the people I named wouldn't even be in it. It was a case of, well, you know, you've know a bit about this case, um, it'll be more or less your show sort of thing. Um, the programme makers came along, um, they, they spent a week, uh, more or less, in the Clansreeslow area. They were interviewing other people who I did know about, uh, witnesses and things like that. And I spent the best part of two days with them. Um, 
I took them up onto the Bermond Mountains. Um, I showed them where the UFO was, or where I believed it was. Uh, I showed them all the evidence to show how I had come to arrive at those conclusions, where the UFO was. I didn't know anything until the day before the programme was going to be aired. Um, the director of the film crew, um, I think it was Ian Leveson, not David Leveson, I think we said earlier. Right. Um, he rang me up and left a voicemail uh, on my phone and he said, uh, the good news is the programmes are being aired tomorrow. Uh, the bad news is you're not in it. And then he went briefly on to explain that the commissioning editor of Channel 5 had pulled all the stuff. If you want to know the truth about the Berwyn incident, it is in the Rich Panet 2011 film, The Berwyn UFO Cover-Up Exposed. So how come these craft are almost always silent? It is possible, of course, for objects to float in midair like a balloon using Archimedes' principle, which states that when a body is wholly or partially immersed in a fluid, it experiences an upthrust equal to the mass of the fluid displaced. In the case of a hot air or helium balloon, the fluid displaced is simply the air, which is a fluid, and the upward force keeping the object off the ground is equivalent to the weight of the air which the object is displacing. And balloons, of course, are silent. Do I really think these triangular craft are hot air balloons? No, I very much doubt it. The thin, flat shape of these objects, along with other characteristics, such as huge acceleration and materialisation, mean it is highly unlikely they are silent balloons. The most likely answer is they are using what is known as a field-based propulsion system. We are all familiar with terms such as gravitational or an electromagnetic field. Such fields do not make any noise, and if they are harnessed appropriately, can produce forces and hence movement or acceleration of an object. To illustrate how a field propulsion system might work, let's just consider this cannonball floating in the vacuum of space. It is far away from any stars and planets and is stationary. According to Isaac Newton, the cannonball would remain at a fixed position unless acted upon by a force. A space rocket, such as the ones used by NASA to power their space vehicles, creates a force on itself by ejecting mass out of one end at high speed. The rocket then experiences a force in the opposite direction to the mass being ejected and accelerates away in this direction. As long as mass is being ejected, the force is maintained and the rocket continues to accelerate until mass is no longer being ejected. So if the cannonball is going to move by itself in a particular direction, it needs to expel out from itself part of its mass. This method of propulsion has a major drawback. The vehicle has to carry within its payload large amounts of extra matter which it uses to eject out in order to move. So the vehicle is constantly becoming lighter. And of course, when it runs out of the extra matter, it can no longer change direction. A far more desirable method of propulsion would be to be able to make the object move without having to eject any mass. If we consider our cannonball and place a large planet next to it, the gravitational field produced by the planet would immediately cause the cannonball to start accelerating downward toward the surface of the planet. This is a field effect, in this case a gravitational field effect. So the cannonball has moved without ejecting any of its mass. It moved due to the influence of a field. Once the cannonball is travelling at a high rate towards the planet, if we were to suddenly move the planet to the other side of the cannonball, the cannonball would start accelerating the other way and change direction. No matter how high the acceleration of the ball, any occupants inside the ball would not feel any force because they are in free fall within a gravitational field. This would be a second major advantage of a field propulsion system. Let's say the object changed direction and appeared to an observer to move at an acceleration of 30 g, that's 30 times Earth gravity, the occupants would not experience any forces on their bodies at all. Is this what was observed during the Belgian UFO flap, described by Professor Emil Schweitzer to the British MOD in 1991? Obviously it's not possible to magically manifest a planet whenever you need one, but it may be possible to manifest fields around a craft that would have the same effect. In 1928, Thomas Townsend Brown received a patent for a device known as a gravitator, which achieved exactly that. Brown discovered the Byfield-Brown effect. When an object consisting of two electrodes of specific dimensions is charged to a very high voltage, a small force is generated which pushes the object in the direction of the field. The force is somehow being caused by the high voltage electric field. 
This force is sometimes called an electrogravitic force and has been discussed by several scientists, including Dr. Paul LaViolette in his book, Secrets of Antigravity. It is quite possible this effect was used as the key principle in developing propulsion systems for top secret aircraft and spacecraft from the 1950s onwards and could be what is propelling the silent triangles seen over the UK by witnesses. Aircraft companies have been getting billions of dollars from the military to develop this stuff in secret, but they signed secrecy agreements, and the military won't let them out of it. An example, and this came through a reliable source, uh, was in the Department of Energy. He heard that Boeing wanted to declassify some of the important electrogravitics work it was doing for commercial use, mm -hmm. and it was denied. This has been going on for decades. They've been working on this uh, in private uh, sort of like Manhattan Project classification. So you're going to have all sorts of craft having been developed. Uh, I firmly believe uh, these aren't used just around the Earth. I mean, th there's actually regular flights uh, throughout the solar system. Obviously, their, their next goal would be interstellar travel. I, I believe that projects like that are already in progress. Another scientist, the Russian Eugene Podklinov, is also alleged to have used high voltage and a superconducting disc to create a force which could potentially be used to silently propel a craft. Discharges these two million volt pulses, the, the test that he was making, um, yes, you, through a superconducting disc. And the, the, uh, the discharge, even though it, it ends up get, uh, smashing against the other electrode, it keeps going in effect as a gravity wave out the end. It's sort of like a, a gravity cannon. It produces a beam of gravity shock waves that is confined. It, 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 it's pretty much non-diverging. For example, they were able to knock books over at two kilometers and even detected its effect at 200 kilometers. So basically, uh, with something like this, you could put a beam between here and the nearest star system and use it to propel a craft. Or you could put it on the craft and uh, be propelling the craft with this, uh, creating its own beam on board. As I mentioned earlier, the B-2 bomber, once airborne, is alleged to have a second mode of travel, where the leading edge of the wings are electrically charged positive and the exhaust gases charged negative. This reduces drag on the aircraft and also reduces the radar signature, both highly desirable in a stealth aircraft. But Dr. Le Violette contends this charge is also contributing to the craft's propulsion, and even that the jet engines can be switched off and the craft fly purely using an electrogravitic mode which would be totally silent. It is highly likely there are a plethora of top secret aircraft which have been kept totally secret out of the public eye using field propulsion. I personally don't think we can say any UFO is a non-human craft just because it has advanced characteristics. That doesn't mean I am saying that all the craft are man-made. But what I can say with absolute certainty is some group or groups are flying craft which are way beyond the capabilities of any publicly known aircraft. They are doing it right under our noses and they are doing it without public permission. Are you happy about this? As I've said throughout the film, we need to find out where these things are going, then expose it to the world. If there are undisclosed secret bases being used to house these craft, I have some good ideas as to how they might be discovered. Anyone else who has further ideas, please get in touch via the website.